Hello, my name is Titi Lokwe Odiebo, and I am an obstetrician gynecologist currently serving as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer in the Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. The Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, is a two-year training fellowship at CDC designed to teach practical epidemiologic skills through involvement in research and surveillance activities including participation in outbreak investigations. As part of my EIS training, I was deployed to Sierra Leone to assist with the CDC's Ebola response. Here is a photograph of where I worked. This is the Kailaun District Health Office, which served as the emergency operating center in the Kailaun District. During my time in the field, I was painfully aware and concerned about the plight of pregnant women. I worked closely with and wrote this case report with colleagues from the Sierra Leonean Ministry of Health, Doctors Without Borders, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. I am pleased to join you today to discuss the case report published in the Green Journal. The 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa is the largest in history. Little is known about the clinical manifestations of Ebola in pregnancy. Reports from previous outbreaks indicate that pregnant women with Ebola had increased risk for severe illness and death, and fetal and neonatal outcomes are very poor with no documented neonatal survivors beyond the first few weeks of life. We present a case of a pregnant woman who survived Ebola but had interuterine fetal demise. Our patient is a 34-year-old gravid of 4, para 3, at 36 weeks gestation, who was admitted to an Ebola treatment unit in Sierra Leone with laboratory confirmed Ebola. She complained of headache, cough, and outrialgia for seven days, but was a febrile. At admission, she reported good fetal movement. She received supportive treatment per Doctors Without Borders protocol, to which she responded well. However, 11 days later, an interuterine fetal demise was diagnosed. The following day, she was retested for Ebola virus RNA. Her blood tested negative, but her vaginal secretions were positive. Thus, a carefully planned induction of labor was performed, attended to by trained and experienced staff using proper infection control measures, including the use of appropriate personal protective equipment. Labor was successfully induced, resulting in delivery of a hydropic stillborn infant. Although the patient recovered from Ebola, a placenta fragment, umbilical cord swab, and a neonatal buccal swab tested positive for Ebola RNA. The patient's postpartum course was unremarkable. She experienced minimal bleeding, did not exhibit any additional symptoms of Ebola, and was discharged two days after delivery. Of note, no exposed healthcare workers were infected. Our case report highlights several important lessons about Ebola in pregnancy, which includes one, Pregnant women can survive Ebola, but the prognosis for the fetus or neonate is poor. Two, appropriate infection control measures in conjunction with personal protective equipment can prevent healthcare worker exposure to Ebola, even during provision of obstetrical care in low resource settings. Three, Ebola virus RNA can be detected in the genital tract and in neonatal products after viral clearance from the maternal blood. And four, Proper infection control measures, including the use of appropriate personal protective equipment by trained obstetric staff is important not only for women with Ebola, but also for women who have recovered. Thank you.